you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm also very glad that everyone has a place to sit. Anyway, we're here today to listen to Dr. Claudia Rankins, who is a program director at the National Science Foundation, and who is kind enough to come down and talk to us about grant writing opportunities and funding opportunities from the National Science Foundation. Um, she'll also be staying after a little bit for some Q&A. So if you have any specific questions, you can stay after, and she'll be more than happy to answer them for you. But now, without further ado, Dr. Rankins. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for hosting me. It's my pleasure to be here. So this is the health disparities um, talk, but I'm talking about everything but health disparities today, so I hope that's okay with you. I just thought I'll tell you a little bit about myself so that you know I'm really one of you. I taught at Hampton University, an HBCU, uh, taught math for many years and then decided to, when the institution had its first PhD program in physics, to pursue a PhD in physics. Then I ended up teaching physics there and was actually chair of the Department of Physics for a while and dean of science for a little bit. So I've sort of done just about everything most of you have done in here at one point. Um, been at the National Science Foundation for uh, six years, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what NSF funds, what we don't fund, maybe some grant writing strategies and insights uh, if, if, if I have such a thing and share that with you. The handout I gave you has a lot of the uh, links that are in my presentation on it and also explains a little bit the different funding mechanisms we have at NSF. So I put up this chart mostly to show you the disciplines that we're funding. So you notice, of course, bi biological sciences. I know there's some biologists in here. We fund computer information science, computer uh, science, all types of engineering, the geosciences, earth, atmospheric, ocean sciences, of course, MPS, math, physics, chemistry, material science, astronomy. Not to forget the social and behavioral sciences, and there we fund research in all sorts of disciplines from anthropology to language to, um, of course, economics and, and, and the sciences that are listed. And sometimes people don't know that the Science Foundation does fund the social sciences. Blinking is the directorate I'm in, and I'll talk about that today. So I'm not talking about the other directorates, but I just wanted you to know the different disciplines and areas that we are funding. And of course, in addition, to the programs I'm talking about today, you're more than welcome to send your research proposals um, to the directorates that are not blinking. You know, so the non-blinking directorates only fund research. Education and human resources funds research and education. And so we have a division on graduate education. The most important program there is the Graduate Research Fellowship Program, and I really want to encourage you to look at that program. It's where students in their senior undergraduate year apply for this very prestigious fellowship, but it takes some assistance and help from faculty for the students to be competitive. So you may want to, if you have like really, really good students going off to graduate school, consider working with them um, to prepare their graduate research fellowship uh, um, proposal. They do get $32,000 in a stipend plus tuition paid at any university of their choice plus travel money, so it's really a nice fellowship to have. Uh, we have the Division of Research on Learning undergraduate education. I'll talk about some of the programs in undergraduate education because I think some of you should probably apply to those. And then, of course, the Division of Human Resource Development, of which I'm a part. So you should subscribe to the National Science Foundation update because it, you get this daily email that tells you what funding opportunities are available. And once you've read that, you can delete it and move on. But uh, if you don't want to get information about everything, you can choose your topics um, and so forth. Because um, you do really only get 90 days from the time an announcement comes out 
to the time you submit your proposal. So if you don't see the announcement until a month prior to when it's due, then it's really too late. 90 days is already not a lot to write a full proposal, right? Uh, and then also sometimes I'll talk about these dear colleague letters a little bit and what they mean. So here's what NSF does not fund, and I thought I'd mention that to you, um, since some of you may be in the health or health disparities field. We don't fund any counseling, clinical, business administration, social work. In education, we only fund STEM education. In history, we only fund history of science. We don't fund clinical studies or sort of community intervention trials. We don't fund anything with disease-related goals um, because that's all the purview of the National Institutes of Health. That's uh, an agency much better funded than the National Science Foundation. So we don't tread on each other's territory. We do fund, however, in engineering um, projects that apply to engineering principles that could aid persons with disabilities. So I just thought I'd let you know clearly what's not fundable. But if you do basic research in biology or chemistry, even if at one point it could be disease related, as long as you don't mention that, we still fund you. Okay, so it's sometimes I tell my PI, it's just a matter of how you phrase it and what you say and how you write your title. So I just have sort of a few general tips on writing a proposal. Um, I don't think you can get anything done in a month or two. You really need to take your time to, to develop the proposal. You'd be surprised how much there is involved in submitting a proposal in addition to just writing up your 15 page or whatever it is, description of your research. That comes easy to most of us. But there's all this other ancillary paperwork that has to be submitted that takes up quite a bit of time. Um, on Fastlane, there is a tutorial for what it looks like if you're submitting a proposal, like what do all of the forms look like, what do I need to do. There also are tutorials for once you are funded, what does my annual report look like, or how do I submit requests for change a change in scope, maybe I have to adjust what I'm doing, uh, maybe I have to adjust my budget. So Fastlane has this demonstration site that takes you through all of the steps before you actually have to do it for real. And if you've never submitted a proposal in Fastlane, I would strongly encourage you to do that demonstration first so you can see how involved it even is to prepare a budget. Um, so then we have these things called program announcements, program descriptions, dear colleague letters, solicitations. And so on that green or yellow handout, whichever color you have, I described a little bit what these various mechanisms are. They basically are telling you when and where you can apply for whatever it is. Some of these mechanisms are very descriptive, like solicitations tell you pretty much sort of step by step what you need to do. Program announcements are very short. This is where we're sort of saying we want your best ideas and we don't give you any guidance on how to do it. And those are typically a little bit tougher for faculty to follow. Um, sometimes we just have these dear colleague letters where we announce opportunities, for example, in light of you know the recent Ebola epidemic, we do have an announcement out um, that ask for proposals that deal with Ebola and you said, well, you just told us no disease related research, but you can research um, issues like the spread of Ebola, uh, preventative measures um, and so forth. So we still don't fund the research into the treatment and the causes of it, but if it's sort of a social science kind of aspect, we do. So um, frequently these dear colleague letters come out and alert you about funding opportunities. And you wouldn't know about them because I think our website is not the most user friendly one. <laughs> so you wouldn't know about them if you just sort of went to the website. So if you subscribe though, then you get all of that information. 
Um, it's certainly okay to contact program officers. Typically when you go to the division or the, the program that you're interested in getting funded to the list of program officers is listed or at least like some sort of generic email. Um, do have a conversation with program officers. I wouldn't say don't have a completely unprepared conversation uh, with the program officer. Have your idea, um, have read the solicitation. I many times get um, calls from people who say they have all these wonderful ideas, but they don't link whatsoever to what I can fund. And I can only fund what's in my solicitation, so clearly they haven't read it. And then that's sort of a waste of time on, on everybody's end. So make sure you know what the program even funds before you call. But then it's good to call program officers to discuss your idea. They, that's, that's what we do. That's our job to give you insight on what might improve your idea or whether it's even appropriate. Um, and then there is this thing called the Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide. And it's a, a very long document, easy to find on the website. And it contains the Grants Proposal Guide. But it takes you step by step through the preparation of the proposal. It tells you, for example, what you can ask for in your budget and what you cannot ask for. It, it tells you how to fill out every one of these single forms that need to be filled out and what should go in those forms and what your budget justification should look like. So this grant proposal guide should be, you know, should be sort of like the document you keep by your side as you prepare um, your proposal and I can easily tell who didn't have it by their side as they prepared their proposal. And also, and I talked to uh, Dr. Rensford this morning about that, become a reviewer. So how do you do that? Because you learn a lot when you come and sit on a panel or even if you're just reviewing on an ad hoc basis a proposal here or there. You learn a lot from that process. The best one is if you come and sit on a panel and participate. Um, the way you do that is you send your CV um, to the program that you're interested in reviewing because it really gives you insight into what distinguishes the good from the bad proposals and, and how this whole process works and, and how this group of reviewers comes about forming a decision on whether your proposal was highly competitive or not competitive. And the, you know, because the, the very first uh, proposal I submitted, even though it was funded, they didn't really like it. And you know, then you get almost a little defensive. Well, didn't they see how great it was? And then you sit on a review panel and then I said, ooh, that was really a bad proposal. I got lucky they funded me for a year. You know, so you gain a lot of insight. And so I just uh, thought I'd really quickly show you what this, this uh, document has in it this proposal and award policies and procedures guide. For right now, the main thing is it gives you preparation, guidance on preparing proposals, but then it also answers all those other questions. You know, I get questions from this thing about no cost extension, when should I apply for it? And then I always say, well, let me look in the grant proposal guide so I give you the right information, sort of to let people know. You could have also looked in it, but it's a, it's a really important document to have. And not only should your sponsored research office read it, but you should as well. Okay, so um, just sort of a few tips, I guess, on writing the proposal. Please do follow all of the guidelines. For example, in the HBCU UP solicitation, I clearly say for each track, you must include this, 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 and this. So when I wrote, proposals to HBCU up. I went to the solicitation and cut and paste what was in the solicitation in my Word document and then I just sort of filled in the details. That way I made sure I didn't forget to address certain issues. Uh, I'll talk for a second a little bit later about the merit review criteria just so you see what reviewers are being told to judge you on. 
Uh, always make sure the budget reflects your work. So, you know, don't say you're going to involve 10 students in your project and then there's zero dollars in the budget for the 10 students or something like that. Um, you should always address scholarly dissemination of what you do. And by that, I mean, where are you trying to publish what you're doing and at what conferences are you presenting that? And even if you have an education proposal like a targeted infusion project or some, there is something to be learned from what you do that you can disseminate in a scholarly way. Uh, you always, you have to various times address the broader impacts of the work, but the the grant proposal guide changes every now and then just to keep us all on our toes. So last year it said you have to, in your narrative, include a paragraph on broader impacts. Half the proposals that came in didn't do that. So, you know, I had to decline them because they didn't follow um, the guidelines in the grant proposal guide. You should always try to talk about how your institution will help you carry that project out and in some way sustain what you're doing. So it's always good to, to get, um, you know, somebody like a dean or a provost on board to write you a nice letter. Now keep in mind, sometimes letters of support are not allowed, but where they are allowed, okay? Because there are proposals like the career proposal, for example. Has anybody ever gone for a career proposal for young faculty They're where they don't allow letters of support? Um, the rec those forms that go with it, if you're thinking, well, that sounds sort of ancillary. That's not the important thing. Reviewers are being asked to look at everything, not only the description of your research, but also, did you fill out the page that asks about facilities? Did you fill out your current and pending support form correctly? Um, if there's a mentoring plan you were asked to submit, did you give some thought to that? There's something called a data management plan that oftentimes um, people who uh, submit to NSF don't know what to do with. So I gave you a link um, on the data management plan, what should go in it. These are all important things. So it's not just the 15 pages that you are talking about your project about, but everything else too. When I say choose your collaborators wisely, I mean you're forever married to your co-PIs, okay? So if you have a co-PI who's a co-PI on something else, who knows somebody who's a co-PI or another proposal, and that third co-PI of that co-PI who is yours doesn't submit an annual report on time, the system freezes everything, no actions can be taken, no awards can be made. So oftentimes I can't make an award to a person because their co-PI's co-PI uh, <laughs> didn't submit the annual report on time. So, um, and you also want to choose collaborators, of course, that, you know, later on, you know, you can work with well, and that are not like an obstacle to what you do, but actually, you know, help you along. You'd be surprised about the proofread thing. I get proposals, I got a proposal where the word mathematics was misspelled in the title and it was about improving mathematics at the institution, guess what happened to that proposal, you know? I mean, no matter how great it is after that, they just lost it right there and then, okay? So uh, I can't stress that proofreading thing enough. Find a friend in the English department. Um, and especially if, like me, my first language is not English. So, you know, we, we do the sentence structure backwards from how English is done. Or um, those of you who are from Asian countries where you don't use the definite articles as much as Americans do. You know, uh, no one has pity or sympathy that English is not your first language. <laughs> you can grade it on how well does the English proposal read. So I always let people read my proposal and then they turn my sentences back right. Um, 
So please do that. Look at other projects that have been funded. You can go to the NSF website. Each program has like a little link where you can click. It shows you the abstracts of what has been funded and the PIs and the PIs contact information. So I can't send you somebody else's proposal, but you could call somebody who is you know, at an institution similar than yours and was successful and say, would you mind sharing? Uh, how did you, uh, how were you successful? What did you say that I didn't say? And the last point, uh, I can't um, make often enough. You know, it's, it's, it's discouraging when we get those reviews back and they weren't like we thought they would be. And when we get that, we're sorry to inform you now, NSF is much nicer than other agencies. We sent you like a nice letter and we sent you your reviews and we sent you some comments on what you could do better. We are not like other agencies who just say, didn't get funded. But nevertheless, it hurts. But just sort of keep in mind, um, funding gets tighter and tighter every year. We haven't seen an increase in funding at NSF in many years. What we have seen is the number of proposals that come in doubling, tripling. You are under pressure now from your deans and your provost and your president to submit proposals and so is everybody else in the country. So I mean, what does that mean? More proposals, same amount of money, fewer proposals get funded. So where our funding rate might have been at about 25% maybe, it's now maybe 20, 15, and some programs even 10%. And if you're a new PI, you have that new PI thing against you, double whammy, then maybe your chance is 20%, uh, 10% sort of at the most. So don't feel bad. It goes up the second time you submit, especially if you listen to what the reviewers say and you don't get defensive and say, what do they know? I knew it so much better. Um, Look at each review that comes back. Take what you know uh, you need to change and ignore what sometimes a reviewer may be out to lunch a little bit too, okay? But uh, do not submit the very same proposal again because guess what? We will read your last year's proposal and if it hasn't changed, then that's not good. All right, so the merit review criteria. I'm just going to check how I am on time here. Yeah. Intellectual merit and broader impact is what you're being judged on. The potential to advance knowledge and the benefit to society. Okay, so don't assume that you're from Albany State University that you should not mention that this is a historically black college, that you have an enrollment of, I don't know what your enrollment of African American and maybe Hispanic students is, and that the broader impacts could be that um, in involving undergraduate students in your project and training students to be competitive to go to graduate school and uh, join the workforce, especially students who are underrepresented in the field you're in. Um, so, you're going to post the slides so you can read these uh, re merit review criteria a little bit more carefully. But keep in mind that's what you're being judged on, okay? Are you advancing knowledge? Is it a benefit to society? Um, is your activity creative, originally, original, potentially transformative? Mm, that's hard, right? Um, do you have a good plan for doing that? Are you qualified? Is your team qualified? So what goes into your CV is important. You only have two pages um, to portray that. And do you have adequate resources available? So you need to convey that uh, really well. And if you don't have the resources on this campus, did you seek out somebody where you have the resources? So I thought I'd talk about just a few select programs that you might want to consider applying to. So in the Division on Human Resource Development, there's a number of programs, but let me start with ADVANCE. Um, it's a program that uh, wants to develop approaches to increase the representation and advancement of women faculty in STEM. 
and sort of uh, looking around the room. I do see women faculty, but it doesn't look like you have 50% of the faculty being women in STEM at the institution. Maybe you do and they're just not here today. But then just because you have the numbers, uh, there may be some issues um, that could be addressed through institutional policy changes and so forth. So if anybody is interested in the, uh, in the advanced program, take a look at it. They also have a new track where uh, you can focus on discipline related issues because the issues women have in engineering may be different than the issues women have in the social sciences. There is then, of course, the HBCU UP program with its various tracks. You have an implementation project on this campus, so you can't have another one for a while. But we have, let me just mention the, the different tracks we have. We have a track for young faculty, the Research Initiation Awards. They're proposals to get your research career started. So they're not for people who are already funded. You can't have any active research funding to apply. Uh, it's $200,000 for two years to sort of get you going. So then hopefully after those two years, you can then apply to the research directorates. We have a track in broadening participation research. Um, this is where sort of the natural science and life science STEM folks should partner with somebody from education or the social sciences to do a study on what works in broadening the participation of underrepresented groups. So there might well be something on this campus that you could study that would shed new lights on why do we not have many African American women in computer science, for example. I'm just throwing some problem out that I know is a problem. Um, and then we have the targeted infusion projects track, and this is for departments or in your case, I guess, divisions to do whatever you think you need to do within that department, whatever would strengthen it. Course development, curriculum development, lab space, whatever. And you can have more than one of those on your campus. The only restriction is each department can only have one active award. So if biology has one, that would not exclude math from having one. Okay, these are fairly nice. If I were a department chair, I'd write one every three years. You get $400,000 for three years, you know, there's a lot you can do with that. Not everything, but there's a lot. So, but sort of keep in mind, um, the HBCR program gets $30 million a year, and if you're saying that's a lot of money, that translates to $300,000 per HBCU. Now it's not so much anymore, right, per year. We get something like 250 proposals every year. When I joined in 06, we got 40 proposals. Now we get 260. Um, so that, of course, then decreases also your chance of being funded. But a lot more institutions have been funded. 85 of the 100 HBCUs now have had funding. And we, we can fund at different levels, individual faculty as well as institutions. But we can't be the answer to every one of the needs of every HBCU. So I want to mention presidential awards. And these are really awards given by the president of the United States but NSF uh, sort of administers them. We do not get very many applications for the teacher award um, from teachers who are either African American or Hispanic. We also do not get very many applications for the uh, mentoring award from faculty at HBCU. So I just thought while I'm here, I throw it out. Nominate somebody who is an excellent mentor for the mentoring award. If you, you have a child in, in school and they have an excellent teacher, nominate that teacher for the teacher award, okay? Um, we started a new program across the education directorate. It's called EHR, so Education and Human Resources Core Research. It's fundamental research in STEM education. 
and we focus on STEM learning, STEM learning environments, STEM workforce development, and broadening participation in STEM. Um, we typically don't get very many proposals in the last category, and we also don't get very many proposals at all from HBCUs, so I sort of encourage you to look at that track. It's a track that has a lot of money. They have like a hundred million dollars, okay? It's a lot more than my program, um, to fund this education research. So if you can think of any issues that have anything to do with these topics at the bottom, I'm sure you can, you should consider uh, looking at that program. The Division on, of Undergraduate Education has a number of programs that may be of interest. Some of you remember the old CCLI program, which then became TOOS, which is now IU's, okay? So IU's Improving Undergraduate STEM Education funds what the old TOOS and CCLI programs funded. They do not have a solicitation, they have what's called a program announcement. So they just tell you, you know, you want two and a half million dollars, send us your best idea. Or if you think you don't want that much, you only want half a million, send us a little bit less developed idea. But again, this is a program that has something to the tune of 80 million dollars. And again, we do not get very many applications from HBCUs. The other day I reviewed the list of reviewers. The panels are coming up. Of the 200 people they selected for reviewers, not one was from an HBCU. So I want to sort of say, flood those program offices with your CV. Say you want to review for the IU's program next time around, okay? Some of you remember the, maybe the old math and science partnership program, that's now called STEM C partnerships. Um, the Robert Noyce, do you have teacher programs on campus? Okay, you should apply for a Noyce uh, scholarship program if you don't have it. This is simply to give those students who want to become teachers money so they can go to school. And the same with the STEM, and I talked to, I think, uh, Dr. Chen, it was you this morning, the STEM, right? That's one you should have, and you can have more than one on campus. One per division, okay? So there could be one in math and computer science, and there could be one in, in the, the biology and chemistry division. This is simply scholarship money, so the institution doesn't get a lot of overhead, but you get enough money to support 10 to 12 students. Um, the max you can give them is $10,000 a year. I don't know how far that goes at your institution. At some institution, like Howard says, okay, uh, <laughs> that'll get them through the first two weeks, but here it may pay their tuition, right? Um, and these are not that terribly difficult to get. Of course, you have to write a good proposal, but, um, you know, make your case uh, for why this institution is unique and what your needs are and what you could do if you could support 10 or 12 students or with the Noise Fellowship, if you could produce in this area where I hear the high schools are still largely segregated because of where people live, uh, not by law anymore, if you could produce uh, teachers to teach in, in the local school systems. Okay, so stay connected, submit your proposals, serve as reviewers and panelists. So if we ask you, try to make it a point to say yes. Um, one point, if you have enough experience, consider being a rotator. We hire people at NSF for a year or two to run a program. Um, so if you're ever interested in that, and then uh, I, I put those uh, websites on the form, and here's my contact information. Maybe I shouldn't leave it up too long, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what I want to say, when you call, if I don't answer email, if I don't email back right away, just send a second email and say, you didn't even respond to me. How rude of you. <laughs> but you have to realize, you know, when you get hundreds of emails a day sometimes things slipped through the cracks, not intentionally. So thank you, I talked 
uh, probably too much. Uh, thank you for your attention.